play part of our <clears throat> you uh, youtube um, lecture which is uh, there on the youtube channel uh, it's dated 20th april so should you like to see further details of kfs you could uh, perhaps be there um today's uh, uh, short session roughly about 30 to 40 minutes would be focused on the apr as a part of the kfs disclosure and i don't think i need to elaborate further that out of all the disclosures relevant for um kfs the apr disclosure is perhaps the most important because the whole idea of the rbi would have been to render comparability of loan offers by letting the consumer know the exact annualized percentage rate that's that's the most important determinant for any borrower to know what is the actual cost is paying <clears throat> and the idea basically was that uh, as lenders quite often um recover the charges in different forms some of them are upfront charges some of them are contingent charges some of them are one time charges splitting the charges across various names that makes the comparability of loan offers difficult for the borrower so particularly when it comes to retail borrowers msme borrowers digital uh, lending transactions the transparency the comparability the simplicity of loan offers becomes critical so the borrower gets uh, an exact um information about what is the cost of lending he is actually paying that was the intent and i'll straight come to therefore the meaning of apr uh, which is what we intend to discuss here today at length uh, we are not getting into details of kfs itself which as i mentioned our last video on the 20th of april has discussed it all it's a fairly long two hour long discussion so should you have the patience and um, should you desire to see that at length please feel free to be there on that video today uh like we are focusing on apr but if there are questions on kfs if the questions which relate to other aspects of kfs to the extent possible within the short duration of 30 to 40 minutes i'll be happy to take those as well uh let's first start by discussing uh what is the meaning of kp apr and if you look at the meaning of apr first the rbi defines it as the annual cost of credit to the borrower which includes interest rate and all other charges associated with the credit facilities first most important point to understand it's annualized cost of credit cost of credit means obviously the biggest component of cost of credit is the rate of interest but if there are other charges which are associated with the credit facility which may not be chargeable on regular basis it may be charged on periodic basis maybe one time it may be charged several times it may actually not be expressed as percentage of outstanding loan it may be expressed in different ways irrespective of the nature of charges if the charges are charges are associated <coughs> with the credit facility the key determinant is all charges it's cost of credit that we're talking about so anything which is coming as a cost of credit beat one time beat multiple times beat and uh, a value expressed as an absolute number a value expressed as percentage as long as it relates to cost of credit it would form part of the apr now we elaborate further that this even includes third party charges even if the charges are payable to third parties with or without a markup of the lender as long as the charge is being recovered by the lender as a necessary attendant or incidental cost of the granting of credit it would still form part of the apr so in terms of the necessary conditions for including something as a part of the apr a there if there are services other than the credit facility for example in addition to selling the loan the lender is selling some other service and is charging something for that non credit related service then the question of adding that cost to the apr does not arise because that's that's an purely completely tangent unrelated service for which there might be a charge i don't need to take that part that as a part of the apr uh, but if the cost is associated with the credit facility for example as a part of the lending transaction i make it sure that the borrower has a life insurance and i make the borrower take a life insurance cover and there's a cost to that which is recovered by the lender 
you ask the borrower to go and insure himself with the insurance company the borrower pays to the insurance company there is no question of the lender including that as part of the apr because the borrower is paying a third party cost to third party not recovered by the lender third party cost is coming to me is a part of the cost of credit associated with the grant or enjoyment of the credit facility then the even if the charge is on a without margin with no margin basis reimbursement of a cost to a third party for example it would still form part of the apr key question would be therefore what forms part of apr and how is the apr actually to be computed these are two very critical questions what forms or what does not form part of the apr and how is the actual computation of apr done the computational aspect is also quite important because after all the computation is mathematical you're not good computing apr manually it's obviously to be done by a system therefore what are the necessary ingredients of the computation of apr i'll be dealing with that uh, in a, a little further detail later so number one cost of credit irrespective of whether the lender is uh, in pocketing that or even if it's a reimbursement it would still form part of the apr the charges need to be associated with the credit facility that would mean it's very important the charges related to credit facility uh, that would mean the charges are incidental or attendant to the availment of the facility uh, the <clears throat> that would mean if the facility was not to be sought or was not granted the charge would not have been there the cost is cost to the borrower and not cost to any other person for example if there is something coming from the vendor a uh, very common practice of subvention charges charges coming from third parties that's not cost on the borrower it's cost some th some third party so the idea basically is talking to talking about cost of credit to the borrower we are not here therefore looking at what is the inflow of the lender we are not looking at the revenue of the lender we are not looking at the lender's revenue we are looking at the borrower's cost the focus is on the borrower's cost therefore third party cash inflows do not have to form part of the apr computation now mathematically apr is the same as the irr of the loan now invariably the apr and the irr would be the same irr meaning the rate of interest the apr and the roi rate of interest would exactly the same if there were no upfront charge if all we were charging was rate of interest we were charging it based on the amount of uh, loan outstanding then the rate of interest interest rate and apr would exactly be the same in other words there would be no need to compare no need to compute to compare the apr i would still compute the apr but it will necessarily find the computation to be exactly the same <coughs> as the rate of interest itself but what makes the apr and the rate of interest different is the existence of upfront or periodic charges or charges which are absolute in nature which are not related to the loan amount outstanding for example i have let's say so called processing fee a processing fee may have been charged before the loan is actually sanctioned whenever this that's a part of the credit process if a charge a processing fee which let's say the loan gets eventually declined loan gets de declined i would not be issuing a kfs at all therefore the processing fee get would would get absorbed but the loan is eventually sanctioned that the processing fee also even though already charged before the kf is issued would still form part of the apr because it's part of the cost of credit so the what makes the computation of apr different from the rate of interest is the existence of either upfront charges or periodic charges or charges which are absolute which are not related to loan amount outstanding and in the process of converting those upfront or absolute cost if, when i say upfront it doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean one time it may be up front maybe well later it might be 3 months later 6 months later a year later periodic charges also as long as the charges absolute periodic charges as well so the question what are we actually doing in the apr computation we are spreading those charges over the loan tenure in exactly the same proportion as the outstanding loan amount i'm sure anyone who understands the, in, the intrinsic method of computation would also understand process is rate because in order for me to know how much is the loan amount outstanding i need to know the exact apr because the amortization of the loan is also done on the basis of the apr so i need to know a what is the loan amount outstanding need to, and, and then i spread and over what term loan of loan amount outstanding over different terms and that's how the upfront or the periodic charges are spread 
so as to convert them into a percentage. So the idea basically is we are converting all these absolute numbers into a percentage. Percentage of what? Percentage of the loan amount outstanding at different points of time. The process of APR computation is mathematically, like I said, a reiterative process. Eventually, it zeroes down on a rate which is true to certain decimal points, which converts all these absolute numbers into a rate. And that APR that we get, therefore, is the sum total of the rate of interest, which is anyway based on the loan amount outstanding, plus those other charges which have now been converted into a rate. For example, if the rate of interest is 12%, and the APR works out to be 12.45%, that 45 basis points is the transformation of upfront cost into a percentage rate. But that, that's the very meaning of APR. So if that's the meaning of APR, then another point which is very obvious is that if the loan tenure or the outstanding amount of the loan at different points of time is contractually not even ascertainable, if contractually the loan amount and the outstanding loan amount were not ascertainable, I'll take an example. If whatever region, the loan amount outstanding and the tenure of the loan are not ascertainable, then there is no way by which I can compute the APR. For instance, take, take, talk, think of it as demand loan. Let's say sanction the demand loan. The demand or let's say think of a revolving line of credit of course as we'll discuss further we'll talk about revolving lines of credit as well in a revolving line of credit the loan would remain alive for a certain period and the loan amount may also continue fluctuate the loan may be drawn fully the loan may be drawn partly the loan may be repaid and then drawn again so the amount of loan outstanding as well as the term both are indeterminate in any situation where the loan tenure and the loan amount are indeterminate, it wouldn't be mathematically possible to compute APR. Therefore, in such cases, while may, we may still reflect the rate of interest and we may separately disclose the absolute charges, computation of APR as a percentage rate would defy the mathematical definition itself because unless I know how is the loan getting repaid, I wouldn't be able to compute the APR at all because the computer would ask me to give the necessary input A over what term and what are the cash inflows contractually stipulated for the cash outflows. Cash outflow meaning the loan disbursement, inflows may be the loan, whatever, equated or unequated payments and the other charges I'm expecting unless the cash outflows and the cash inflows are exactly stipulated, I wouldn't be able to compute the APR at all, because that's the mathematical limitation of the APR. So APR may be computed only if the loan tenure and the amount of loan outstanding at different points of time is contractual. Contractually, what is the loan tenure? And contractually, what are the loan repayments expected are ascertainable. Now, contractually, the loan tenure might be one year, but I might repay it, let's say, after three months. That's a different issue. So disregarding all options, option to prepay, option to delay, or whatever be the options, disregarding the options, contractually, whatever be the loan term, contractually, if I'm able to draw, for example, a limit of 10 lakhs, then contractually, assuming that the entire loan has been drawn down, over whatever tenure, the once the loan is contractually drawn down, over what term is the loan payable, that's the term for the purpose of computing APR. Certain instances, for example, particularly, let's say, think of, let's say, home loan. A home loan is sanctioned for a value of 30 lakhs. Disbursement does not happen immediately. There might be costs which are charged upfront. Disbursement may take time. If the disbursement takes time, I wouldn't know what's the actual loan outstanding at different points of time. So in such situations, for computing APR, it's a valid assumption to make that the entire loan has been disbursed. That is to say, for computing APR, we may appropriate the charges over the loan tenure on a fully disbursed basis. Think, for example, of, let's say, a credit facility where a loan amount of 1 lakh has been sanctioned, but the borrower draws only 70,000. And I charge, let's say, 2% processing fee. Will I relate this 2% 2 processing fee to a loan of 1 lakh or only 70,000? If the borrower has drawn 70,000, he could have drawn 1 lakh. I may logically spread the APR assuming the loan is fully drawn. 
So on a fully drawn basis, except in case of revolving lines of credit, revolving lines of credit are not a term loan at all. Because in revolving lines, the question of APR computation as different from rate of interest does not even arise as uh, mathematically, uh, as also regulatorily, the disclosure is, is not relevant in case of revolving lines of credit. Now, I am not saying disclosure is not relevant. Disclosure need not be given. If, if for whatever reason, a particular loan uh, type is not strictly falling within the APR uh, disclosure requirement, because the idea basically is transparency. Therefore, transparency is needed in all lending transactions. Therefore, let's not try to draw border lines of distinction and say, in my case, the APR is not applicable. Therefore, I will not give KFS at all. KFS basically is to present the key factual, the key facts of a loan transaction in an understandable, transparent, and simple, comparable format. The biggest merit of KFS is comparability. So the borrower may make a wide choice by comparing your loan terms with those of a competitor. Therefore, the idea basically is not to draw lines of escape and wriggle out of KFS. The idea is basically, yes, I'll make disclosure. Wherever the my terms of loan are not exactly, let's say, matching the RBA's and Visa's loan term terms, in that case, I will still make a best disclosure where I might need to add a line or might need to add a particular uh, a distinctive clause. I can do that, but the idea basically is to retain the comparability and still make a transparent disclosure for the borrower's benefit. So the idea basically is give all inclusive cost of credit, including uh, the credit cost, the operating cost, the processing fee, the verification charges, maintenance charges, third party charges as well. We discussed earlier third party charges too. Even though the borrower is not adding a markup would still be part of the APR. Now, it would of course not include contingent charges. Contingent charges, for example, a default occurs delayed payment charges, penalties. These obviously will not be part of the APR because these are contingent upon a contractual performance not being done. Prepayment, for example, is also contingent. So anything which is contingent, for example, if the borrower makes a loan balance request and you charge rupees 200 for giving a loan statement to the borrower, that depends on how many times the borrowers ask for it. So these are contingent charges. I will still need to disclose them but these are not part of the APR. Penal charges, late payment charges, third party products, if there's any kind of cross sell, that's also not part of the APR. Another very intriguing point is what about security deposits? There's a <clears throat> security deposit, let's say, insisted upon by the lender as a part of the loan contract. Whether security deposit should form part of the APR or not, usually our answer would be that security deposit is a cash flow from the borrower to the lender, like loan is a cash outflow from the lender to the borrower, a security deposit becomes a reverse cash flow from the borrower to the lender, and that may or may not attract a particular rate of return. For example, security deposit may be capturing some kind of interest rate also that's dependent on the way the lender structures. Usually, the, in the, the you know, cash outflow of the lender and the cash inflow, which is which is though, well, that's a, still a margin, that's still a sort of um, collateral or a margin requirement for grant of the loan. But usually it doesn't make sense to mix up the security deposit cash flows, which is cash flow from the borrower to the lender. I am time and again conditioning myself saying this is usually how it should be. But if circumstances so warrant that the security deposit is integral part of the loan cash flow, the loan has been priced on all-inclusive basis, capturing security deposits, security deposit is substantial. <clears throat> and all the more, if for the purpose of um, you know, effective interest rate competition for accounting, accounting purposes, if the security deposit has been taken as a part of the EIR computation, then it might be wise to include the security deposit cash flows as a part of APR2, but usually I would suggest the financing side of a transaction, the way the lender's investment in transaction is funded, a security deposit ways becomes in a way a mode of funding the transaction. That should usually be kept. <coughs> Sorry. Usually we kept distinct lending uh, cash outflows of the transaction. 
uh, of course, it's also important to consider whether the payments are coming in advance or arrears. Sometimes the loan cash, the loan EMIs uh, might be coming in advance basis. That would mean the first cash flow comes immediately as the loan is dispersed. So in computation of APR, the advance versus arrears nature of transaction, nature of the cash flows also needs to be factored. That would mean you're doing APR computation on, on uh, any spreadsheet. If the payments are coming in advance, you'll need to factor that advance payment as a part of the APR computation. Is APR the same as XIRR? And the answer is very clearly no. XIRR is different. XIRR captures annually discounted cash flows. APR is not XIRR. <clears throat> APR is what is in spreadsheet parlance called the nominal rate. It's nominal. There are two terms typically used in spreadsheets, nominal rate and effective rate. APR is the nominal rate. So normally the payment period is, for example, a month. A spreadsheet will compute the rate of interest or APR for a month. And then we multiply it by 12 to annualize. We are annualizing the periodic rate. Remember the word, annualize percentage rate. Percentage rate we get for the period. If the payments are quarterly, the spreadsheet will compute the rate quarterly. If the payments are monthly, the spreadsheet will compute it monthly. If the payments are, for example, say, say weekly, fortnightly, the spreadsheet will compute the rate of interest for the period. That periodic rate has to be annualized by simple annualization, not by compounding it to a year. For example, if the payments are monthly, I don't need to multi, I don't need to compound the monthly rate to a year. I can simply multiply the monthly rate by 12 and compute the annualized rate. Now, taking some examples of what will or will not form part of APR. Uh, first question, administrative charges that the lender charges very surely a part of the APR. Credit verification charges, field investigation, all of these are part of attendant cost to credit. These are certainly part of the APR. They may be one time, they may be proportional, they may be charged irrespective of the loan, whether actually getting sanctioned or not. It might have been charged even before the loan is sanctioned. It would still form part of the APR. That would mean the timing of the payment, the timing was before the issuance of KPS will not make a difference as long as the charges were incurred in the loan journey. They would, as, as a necessary part of the grant of credit facility, they would still be part of the APR. Documentation charges, for example, some people say, well, a cost of um, a legal charges paid to a lawyer for drafting would, even though it's a third party payment, it would still be a part of the APR. Next, mandate registration. If there is any kind of registration charges uh, for mandate with the banker, that would also form part of the uh, APR. Disbursement charges, bureau charges, bureau charges, credit bureau charges. For example, civil cost will also be part of the APR. Processing charge, any SL charge, stamp duty. Now, this is a little tricky thing because the stamp, there's no service provider here. Stamp duty is a cost payable to a statutory authority. Normally, what is to be taken as part of APR is third party service providers. One cannot argue the state is providing a service. The state is charging stamp duty as a revenue function, not for providing a service. There's no service inherently provided by the state. Therefore, stamp duty, though a third party payment, though might be reimbursed exactly by the lender, however, it's a third party payment, which is not relating to a service. But if the stamp cost is, for example, 500, lender is charging 1000, then the differential would still be a part of the APR. Surside charges, though a small amount, I would think still they say, it should be part of the APR. Similarly, valuation charges would be a part of APR too. Now, some charges questionable, like I mentioned, subvention charges from third parties, surely not a part of APR. It's, I'm not saying they don't disclose it. Disclosure is different. Lender discloses rate of interest to be zero, though the subvention makes it 15%. Should I say the cost of credit is zero? Uh, that's a misleading disclosure. I would still say cost of credit is rate of interest is 15%. Discount given by vendor is whatever amount, and therefore the net charges to the borrower is zero. That would mean appropriately while disclosing the rate of interest, one may disclose the rate of interest expected by the lender, the subvention given by the vendor, 
and therefore the net cost of interest and therefore the APR may still show as zero. But the APR is zero. I'm not saying the the lender's returns are zero as well. No lender can understandably be given a loan, giving a loan without charging interest. Therefore, disclosure may still be required, but not a part of APR. Uh, moving from fixed to floating charges, no question of this being a part of APR because that's anyway contingent. Charges for issuing account statement, NOC, etc. Charges for obtaining credit information report, well, may or may not be there. Uh, similarly, third party charges would not be a part of the APR. This APR is not relevant in case of revolving line of but whether the credit facility in question is a revolving line of credit or not becomes a very critical question. We have earlier discussed in one of our write-ups the essential ingredients of a revolving line of credit. And we said that the basic, basic feature of a revolving credit facility is that the lender grants the facility up to a limit. The borrower may avail any point of time the entire limit. The borrower may pay part of it. As the borrower pays a part of it, the part which is now unutilized is once again available for a drawdown. That would mean I have a right to sweep up to the credit facility. I can pay it back anytime and then draw it again up to the full facility. That is the key feature of a revolving line of credit. Mere grant of an exposure limit, mere fixing of an exposure limit does not mean it's a revolving line of credit. Like I mentioned, reiterating, the key feature is that I have a right to dip the draw the facility up to the amount once again we are almost about to exhaust our time for today in fact uh, yeah it's almost like 30 minutes now uh, but let me just quickly see in over the next five or six minutes are there any questions at all either from any of the participants or are there questions on the chat? I believe there are some questions that kept on popping during the chat. I wouldn't, didn't have time to go through, but my colleagues can help me if there are any questions on the chat or any of the participants. Yes, would, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just read out the questions on the cha uh, chat so that you can uh, please take it up. Go ahead, uh, If the cross-sell charges are being routed through the RE to a third party, should it be included in the API? Cross-sell, meaning there's some other service. It's being routed through the RE, but for some other service. Mere routing of the cost to me does not make it a part of API. That would mean charges associated with the grant of the credit facility will be a part of API, but charges for some other facility. For example, let's say, say I mean, there is some asset management contract or there's some, I wouldn't even understand what, but any, any third party service which is unconnected with a loan transaction, which has been routed through the regulated entity, let's say investment advisory services. You are engaging with some investment advisor through the RE. The mere fact that the fees routed through the lender will not make it a part of the APR. Anita. Um, Any views on the insurance premium funded by the lender? Will it be a part of the APR? Uh, I think this uh, in our last video, we've done a detailed discussion on that. But uh, I'll quickly say that insurance costs, Looking at the way the RBA is actually included insurance costs as a part of the illustration as well. My recommendation is please have the insurance costs directly collected in the name of the insurance company. In order to avoid any controversy, I would suggest let the insurance payment be directly collected in the name of the insurance company. You can still have your whatever uh, corporate agency commission from the insurance company, but don't route it to the lender to avoid any controversy. Anita. Does the KFS needs to be signed before the loan agreement? KFS needs to be signed before or at the time of the loan agreement. Normally, I would say it's a it's a part of the sanctioning process. So when you sanction, you probably give a disclosure. This is my money. I need to give a key factual statement before the loan gets actually signed. It may be co-terminus. That is, it may it may happen along with the loan, but usually it should be either before or at the time of the loan agreement. Anita, any of these points, if you have something to add, please feel free. So we got no, roughly uh, about agree. three and a half minutes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Right. Uh, if there are uh, any value-added services are being sold to the customer, then whether the charges any for third such value-added services? Any third-party services other than the credit facility, you can call in value-added, but they are not related to the grant of credit facility. They were not necessary ingredients of the credit facility. They will not be part of the APR.
uh, I think someone also wants to speak. Uh, uh, if we have time, we can. Uh, time uh, is question... the constraints. I would not suggest doing that because we just got three minutes. Right. But if there are other questions on the chat, kindly say. Is sanction so letter compulsory if we provide KFS? Uh, sorry, Anta, was just once again. Is sanction letter compulsory if we provide KFS? Sanction letter would still be advisable because KFS is a standard format which is uh, pre-cast. But you might like to give other statements. For example, you might say there are conditionalities. So a sanction letter is always advisable. You might write your own conditions as a part of the sanction letter, which are not a part of KFS. Whoever wanting to speak, you can probably uh, the participant who was wanting to speak kindly say. We just got two minutes. So uh, kindly be so, yes, sir. So the only one question, like there is a concept of a validity period. Uh, so, like, say, sir, in the digital lending journeys, where you know a borrower is shown an offer. Now, see if there is an internal policy say that the offer is valid for say 10 days 15 days or 30 days typically the kfs is something you know which comes at a later stage once the borrower uh, has seen the offer now say if the borrower you know drops off and does not accept the offer say after he comes after five days he continues the journey and then uh, he sees the kfs then from there we have to give three three working days validity period because say because in that case my offer might have expired at the back end and I might not want to give that offer to the customer now. So how do we kind of deal with such kind of issues, sir? So today's session was largely focused on APR, not on the other parts of KFS, but I think it's covered in our last video. But uh, quickly on your point of the, the validity is the, because giving of a KFS is like making a statement to the borrower that I'm willing to give a loan. And if the, if the grant of the KFS had a validity and the validity is expired already, and the borrower now comes and we are, let's say, in that case, I should suggest issuing an, a fresh KFS. If you're saying the last KFS has expired, the borrower now wants to avail the loan. I don't want to be driven by the last KFS. I would suggest giving a fresh KFS. But uh, uh, what you stated was largely factual. I've not been able to absorb that with a very limited time. I just got one minute. Uh, uh, so but one more question is, is IRR uh, same as APR? IRR is the same as APR. It's not, not XIRR, I'm saying IRR, not XIRR. We compute the IRR by writing the cash flows exactly as they take place with absolute amounts uh, and the timing. And then we compute IRR. The result is the APR. Uh, almost time to wind it up. So thank you very much. It's been a fast track session today. Uh, sorry, I've not been able to consider all questions, but that was the intent today. Thank you very much. And Please do watch our last video dated 20th April. It's on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a ton. Be ready to implement post first. Good. Wish you all the very best. Bye-bye.